Good morning, y'all. Hope you're doing well this morning. That's a nice, cheerful text to come back to after Thanksgiving. Woe to all of you. (laughs) Um, My name is Nathan Johnson. I'm the discipleship director here at Paradox. Um, Been here about five months or so. It's been a real joy to be with you, uh, to to have been here and be a part of staff and be a part of what's going on here. Uh, My wife, Melissa, and I moved here this summer from Springfield, Missouri, Um, but I'm I'm from Abilene originally. Um, That's where, uh, and then I I came here, lived here for four years uh, while I was in school. That's where I met Jim and Matt and a few other people. Um, It's been just really, really cool to see how the Lord has answered those prayers and, and fulfilled those dreams um, and the passion of Jim. Um, back we used to meet, and we were in the same church planting residency at City View Church back in the day, and um, it's been really cool to see how just the Lord has answered those prayers. And you guys are a, a providence of that. Y'all are an answer to a prayer um, that, that he's been praying. Um, let's see. Man, the Lord has been good to us, been good to my our son, my wife, we've moved here, um, kind of plugged in, kind of getting settled in. And it's been really cool to get plugged in at Paradox. This is a really sweet church. We're highly relational. We love people. We love to love people here, which makes this text kind of a difficult one um, to work through together. But I think we've got um, some good things to see. And I think the Lord has some really cool grace in us, uh, in, in this season for us, in this, in this sermon for us. So we're in the middle of Luke's gospel today, we're we'll be in 37 through 54, like we just read. This is the third week that we've had um, some hard sayings from Jesus. This is like the third shot across the bow here. And a couple of weeks ago, Jim talked about what it looks like to respond poorly to Jesus and had some warnings for us there. And then last week, he talked about being careful that the light in us isn't darkness. Today, we're going to see a dinner party that's more awkward than the one in season four of The Office. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. So... But there's grace in this morning, and we're going to get there. But I, w- I want to pray for us. I want to pray for our time um, and see kind of where we go with it. Father, we praise you. We pray that you would give us ears to hear the word that you have provided us. I pray that these hard words would be gracious and life-giving because they come from you, who is the author of life and of our salvation. So I pray that you would give me clarity and wisdom, and I pray that you would let us see your glory in these next few minutes as we work through your word. Lord, we love you and we trust you. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so what we're gonna talk through here, so if you're taking notes, if, you, if you're a highly structured person like I am, um, we're gonna work through this text a bit by bit and kind of see some sections here. The first section, verses 37 through 41, we're gonna see Jesus generally rebuke hypocrites, and then he's gonna move into woes to the Pharisees, that's verses 42 through 44, and then verses 46 through 52, he's gonna rebuke the scribes and the, and the lawyers, and then we'll see how everybody responds in verses 53 and 54. So that's kind of the general structure we're going to go for. We'll see what we make of it. So verses 37 through 41, we'll see Jesus rebuking hypocrites. I'll read the verses and then we'll, we'll work through it. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. So verse 37 here, Jesus is eating a meal at a Pharisee's house. These Pharisees were well-known, uh, ruling class Jewish men who were very holier than thou. They were, they were really righteous. They were very publicly righteous. They would exercise their faith in a very public way. And they would also let people know that. They, they knew that they were righteous people. They followed traditions that were developed from the Old Testament. And they made lots of rules and judgments based on those traditions. And they're not all bad, but it is important to know that they're, they're never the good guys in the Bible. If you ever see a Pharisee, he's automatically the bad guy. He's the guy that wears the black hat. He's the bad guy. No questions asked. Um, they're never the good guys, like never. The apostle Paul was one, but even then he became a Christian. He was a bad guy and then he became a good guy, right? So um, Pharisees are, have a rough go of it in scripture. 
But then verse 38 here says, Jesus doesn't wash before dinner. This is a ceremonial um, and a traditional issue, not a hygiene. He's not a dirty guy. He's not like he gross. He's like, it's just, this is an extra ceremonial washing that the Pharisees traditionally would do. And Jesus just didn't do it. He just came in and sat down and said, let's, let's get after it. So the Pharisees came up with a bunch of rules to follow that were based on God's rules, but they went further and were more restrictive with their rules than, than most everybody else in society and than, than scripture would have been. So a, a good analogy, I don't know if I'm going to step on some of my fellow Baptist's toes, but a good analogy of that would be like saying you can't dance or you can't drink. Those are not biblical requirements, but that's what Baptists, that's generally the Baptist camp would say, that's, we're going to kind of bring the, the lines in a little tighter to make sure we don't sin, make sure we're not tempted to sin, right? The Pharisees were doing the same things, and they would use these rules to control people. But Jesus refuses to follow this rule, and he turns the tables on this Pharisee. And in verse 39, he says, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. I am from the South, and this is most certainly not polite dinner conversation. This is not how you, this is not a polite Southern man talking. Verse 39, so Jesus rebukes them. The Pharisees are clean on the outside, but they're dirty on the inside. They're concerned with ceremonial washings and making sure everyone is following the rules, but in their hearts, they're greedy and evil people. They believe that the way to be right with God is to clean, is to clean themselves and follow all the rules, and they also believe in their heart that their hearts don't really matter at all. It doesn't matter how good you look on the outside, though. It doesn't matter how many extra biblical traditions you follow. Your behavior cannot cleanse your heart of sin. But this runs counter to the Pharisees. They didn't care what you did. They didn't care why you did something. They, they only cared that your behavior was correct. So kind of an illustration, this picture this with me. It's a bright morning on a warm summer day. You're heading out the door to go run errands with your coffee. Maybe you throw a little cream and sugar in there because, you know, simple pleasures. Or maybe you're hitting some early morning protein in your shaker bottle. You, you finish it, and you leave it in your car, and you go run your errands. You go about your day. You go to work. You do whatever it is that you're doing, right? But then that day, the day starts to kind of heat up, right? That dude's just sitting in your car, like ripening. And you get done with work or whatever you were doing, and you open your car, and you see it there, like, glaring at you, right? And you get home, and now you have to deal with it. Now you have to figure out how to clean this thing. What's the best way to clean that nasty thing that you got there. What's the best way to clean that? You, yeah, you leave it for your spouse. That's exactly what you do. That's, that's the best. That's just, it works for me. It's awesome. But you, you can't just clean the outside. I don't, I don't actually do that. <laughs> Nobody take me seriously on that. Please don't. Uh, my wife is in the balcony. I, I don't do that. <laughs> um, but you can't just clean the outside and call it good, right? There's no amount of scrubbing with bleach or steel wool that you can do on the outside of that cup to make it clean on the inside. You have to pry the lid off and finish dry heaving, and then you got to get to work, right? Jesus is saying these Pharisees have the outside spotless, but the inside is all kinds of nasty. In verse 40, he goes on to say, if God cares about the cleanliness of cups, how much more does he care about our hearts? See, God is concerned with both the outside and the inside. He cares about what we do on the outside, and he cares even more about what's going on in our hearts. You see, both need to be clean because both belong to God. He's created both of them. You can be the biggest germaphobe, obsessive compulsive cleaner, buying Lysol by the case, but there's no amount of scrubbing you can do to make your heart clean. There's no amount of showers that you can take that will wash away sin. And Jesus' message to the Pharisees is very simple. Don't just take a shower. Repent. In verse 41, Jesus goes on to say, Give as alms those things that are within, and everything will be clean to you. He's, not saying, he's, he's saying to not just give money, but give yourselves the things that are within. If you give your heart, then everything else will be clean. Your actions can't make your heart right, but if your heart is right, then your actions will follow. They'll begin to follow. And this is how we live rightly. We need inner purity, not just right behavior. Inner purity is what will result in a righteous life. These Pharisees are upset that Jesus didn't wash his hands before dinner, but Jesus is who washes us clean on the inside and gives us his righteousness. 
And the way to enter purity is to repent of your sin, to place your faith in the Lord Jesus who died as a sacrifice for you and rose again to defeat sin and death. When Jesus washes you clean, he doesn't just run you under the sink with some dish soap and a scrub brush. He washes you with his blood that cleanses every sin and breaks every chain. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he doesn't stop there. He equips us to follow him by sending the Holy Spirit, the spirit who convicts you of sin, who leads you to repentance, who comforts you, who helps you understand the Bible, who gives you gifts to use in the church for the glory of God. Jesus washes the inside and the outside of the cup. And we surrender our hearts to him. He does amazing things in and through us. But some of you may be thinking, what if I'm really, really, really good at washing the outside? What if, I, what if I'm really good at looking good? What if I scrub harder than everybody else? What if I follow all the... Isn't there something for me on that? Well, Jesus has a few things to say for you. Six things, in fact. The first three are in verses 42 through 44. I'll read that. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So the first half of 42, he says, woe to you. This is a warning of a coming judgment because they're living in a fool's paradise, not knowing that their path ends in hell. And then the last couple of parts of that verse says that it talks about them tithing spice racks but neglecting justice and the love of God. He's calling out their hypocrisy. They're focused on traditions and not what the Lord wants or commands. And just like the extra washings, these this tithing practices are extra biblical. You can look through the whole Bible and it doesn't tell you to tithe your spice rack. It tells you to be it tells you to tithe and manage your money faithfully and what it tells you what to do is offering sacrifices, but it doesn't tell you to tithe your spice rack. And Jesus isn't telling them that tithing isn't important, but he's saying to tithe and also embrace justice and also love the Lord. He's telling them that even though they are so detailed and scrupulous with their tithing, their spice racks, they haven't gone far enough. They need to do more. And here we see that legalists, the Pharisees are legalists. They they major on the minors. They obsess over minute details, but ignore the larger principles. Legalists also miss the point of the law. You see that in the Old Testament, God gave the law to show us that we can't be good enough on our own. We need God's grace because we fail all the time. And the only way we can be righteous before God is if he does it himself. If you don't catch anything else from the Old Testament, understand that, that you cannot do it on your own and you need the Savior that's promised in the Old Testament. The law is meant to humble us, not puff us up with pride. So this may be a bit of a hard question, but are you a hypocrite? No, of course not. There's no hypocrites here. Of course not. I'm not one either. But how would you know if you were? Do you, do, do you know? Do you have things built into your life to know if you are being hypocritical? Are you more focused on your performance and being correct, or are you caring for people's souls? Are people real to you? Or are they just, like one of my old pastor friends said, are they just machinery or scenery? Machinery in that they serve a purpose, they get my coffee, they do my bidding. People are just machinery to go fuel what I'm doing in my life. Or are they scenery? They're something to look at as I go through. It's just this backdrop of things to look at and and enjoy as as I go through my life on my own agenda. Are people machinery or scenery to you? Or are they souls? Jesus is saying to honor the Lord with your obedience, but don't miss the bigger picture of being Christ-like. And Jesus did this. He was perfectly obedient in every way. He never sinned. But he also never lost focus on the bigger picture of justice and the love of God. That love and justice is, is most clearly seen on the cross. We see the justice of God pouring out his wrath on his son for our sin and the, the love of God providing a sacrifice for us so that we could be welcomed in as his children. So we see the, the love and the justice of God meeting at the cross. So we can't neglect those things. The second woe here in verse 43 it says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. 
The second warning involves loving fame. There was a, a seat rank at feasts. I've never, I don't think I've ever been popular enough or affluent enough to be invited to a, a feast that has seat ranks. But back then they had them, and these Pharisees enjoyed sitting in those honored places. They liked being known as the righteous guys. They liked being honored with elaborate greetings in public. So you would meet a Pharisee in public, and he would expect that you would be, oh, here's Dr. So-and-so, and et cetera, et cetera. They would love that. They loved having their ego stroked like that. But Matthew 23, 5 says that they do all of these things to be seen by others. And who doesn't like to feel appreciated and honored, right? We have a culture of honor here at Paradox that I love. I think it's a beautiful thing that we do. But who doesn't like to feel that? But the problem is clamoring for fame and honor gets you nowhere in the long run. At the end of the day, legalists struggle with pride. And when you put yourself on a pedestal and look down on everyone else because they don't meet your standards, it's impossible to be humble about that. And Jesus is saying it's really hard to serve people in a Christ-like way when you're trying to get a better seat at the table. It's really hard to have compassion on someone and help them when you're trying to prove how much better you are than they are. Ultimately, the problem is that the Pharisees don't want to worship God. They want to be worshipped. They're concerned with their seat at the table and being respected in public, but... We see with Jesus that he was ridiculed and humiliated and he laid his life down so that we would have a seat at his wedding feast. And now we don't have to worry about our own reputation. When you have an invitation to the wedding supper of the lamb, it doesn't matter what seat you have there. So do you want to worship God or do you want to be worshiped? You cannot have it both ways, brothers and sisters. The third woe in verse 44 it says, woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. This idea of unmarked graves. In Israel, dead bodies and graves were ceremonially unclean. People weren't supposed to go around them, or you'd have to go outside the camp and wash and make yourself clean, and then come show yourself to the priest, and you'd be restored and all these different things. But unmarked graves, the, the unmarked aspect of that is that people will become unclean without even knowing it. These Pharisees, with all their rules and hypocrisy, are leading people astray. They're leading others to believe that what they're doing is a good thing, but really leading them astray. And it's as though they're becoming unclean without even knowing. And that is so destructive. In a similar passage in Matthew 23, the phrase is whitewashed tombs. This means that the tomb looked great on the outside, but it, it didn't look like a tomb, but it was actually full of death. The Pharisees look great on the outside. They're knowledgeable. They're model citizens. They're respected. They mow their yards, right? They do, they do things right. But their teachings lead to death rather than life. Earlier this year, I was reading about how slave owners in the 18th and 19th centuries would use parts of the Bible to keep their slaves obedient. They crafted what became known as slave Bibles, where they would carefully remove every passage about freedom and redemption and the atonement of Jesus. They, they kept the rules and suffering and obedience, but they, they took out everything about hope. They took out the entire book of Exodus except for two chapters of laws. They took out Joshua and Ruth and Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and Lamentations and Romans. They left all the rules and everything about Paul and prison, but they took out all of the worship in Psalms and all of the hope in Revelation. They took out all of the story that leads to the glory of God and the redemption of his people from sin and death, and it made me sick to my stomach to see, to see that wicked people would intentionally cut the gospel out of the Bible and use it, use what was left to enslave and oppress others. But that's the message of the Pharisees. Rules without hope. Rules without redemption. May it never be said that our church preaches that filth. We preach Jesus. We lead people to the living water of Christ's perfect life, his atoning death, his resurrection, his victory over sin and darkness. We preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, because it's the power of God unto salvation. We lead people to Jesus and see that he fulfilled the law and his, and his obedience brings us freedom. You see, God doesn't love us because we're awesome at following rules. He loves us because Jesus is awesome and Jesus gave us his righteousness. And rather than being unmarked graves saying work harder, 
We proclaim an empty tomb and a risen king who has led us to freedom for the glory of his name. So who are you leading people to? No other name can save but Jesus. These Pharisees are unmarked graves. They're leading people astray. But Jesus came out of his tomb to lead us in the newness of life. And woe to anyone who preaches salvation by any other name. So with these three woes, Jesus rightly condemns the Pharisees. They're consumed with a washing that doesn't cleanse. They're preoccupied with their own reputations, which defames the Lord. And they lead people astray with legalism, which leads to death. He finishes this opening salvo, and this isn't in the text, but there's probably this stunned silence that just settles over the room. He just wrecks this party, right? What he said is incredibly offensive, but he is absolutely right. Let's take a look at verses 46 through 52, woes against the lawyers. This first woe, verse 45, one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. So this lawyer speaks up. He's taking offense at what Jesus is saying. This is a a tense moment, but it's a bold strategy to say, hey, Jesus, you're offending me too. That's a bold strategy. Let's see how it works out for him. Lawyers here are also known as the scribes. They're people, they're experts that studied the Bible, that made copies of it. They taught people what it said. They had their own traditions that they taught as well. And they're often lumped in with the Pharisees. They're not the same thing, but they're often kind of lumped in together because they're similar in a couple of ways. But if the Pharisees are the political ruling class public figures, the scribes are the theology nerds who knew a lot about the Bible and taught in the synagogues. And this lawyer happens to be offended. And Jesus is calling them to repent. This lawyer is not cut to the heart. He's offended. Verse 46, and Jesus says, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. This idea of burdens in verse 46, the burdens for others they can't bear. In their teachings, these lawyers would contextualize the law and they would say, here's how you live this out. So here's here's the law and here's what it means for you to do today. And they would issue more commands. And you see this in a lot of places. It's very popular to do nowadays. You do these five things and heal your marriage or here are three steps to thriving financially. It is quite popular, but there's a couple of major problems with it. Often these standards are not in the Bible. They're, they're just kind of man's wisdom packaged as scriptural instruction, but they don't come from the text. And then also, if it's not focused on Jesus, then it's just self-help moralism. If it's not talking about how Jesus is the one who helps us in these things, then it's just self-help moralism, and you're no better off. So that's what these lawyers or scribes are doing. They're just heaping new commands on people, and they aren't helping. They're just explaining the requirements and saying, good luck. This is Pharaoh demanding that the Hebrews make bricks without straw. But the gospel, the gospel brings us better news. Rather than heaping more work and heavy burdens on people and shaming them, Jesus calls the weary and heavy laden to come to him and find rest in him. He tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's a famous hymnist named John Barrage who says it really, he he encapsulates this really, really well in this quote. He says, run, John, and work, the law commands, yet finds me neither feet nor hands, but sweeter news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and lends me wings. So if you're preaching the gospel and someone feels like they have more work to do so that God will love them, then you're doing it wrong. Anything we need to do as Christians has, has to come from a place of already being loved by God first and then working that out in the way that we live our lives. It has to come from belonging to Christ first and then honoring him. You should also be willing to help. These lawyers were unwilling to lift a finger to help, but that's not what Christians do. You don't have any business. This may be a, this may be a bold thing to say, but it's full of bold stuff this morning, right? Right? You don't have any business calling out sin in someone unless you're willing to jump in the trenches and help them out. If you're just going to say, hey, you're a sinner and you're doing it bad this way, and I'm not going to help you with that, that's not the right way to do it. If you're married, there's no his problem or her problem. They're our problems. Get on the same team. Fight alongside each other rather than with each other. 
bear each other's burdens, get messy in life together because life is messy. But that's what God has ordained us. That's who he's equipped us to do, what he's called us to do as Christians. The second woe to the lawyers, verse 47, says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. And then it goes on down in a few verses. I want to kind of summarize it here. I'd love to get into the the nitty-gritty details, but uh, I want want to make sure we're not here for like three hours. So Jesus accuses them of rejecting the prophets like their fathers. In previous generations, God sent prophets to Israel to preach the gospel, but fairly often they have a really rough go of it, to be honest. They're, they're, they're run out of town, they're pelted with rocks, they're killed. Their message is often rejected and ignored, and the people go their own way. It's, I mean, it's a really, like being a prophet in the Old Testament is a pretty rough gig, to be honest with you. But in verse 51, there's this, this phrase, um, from Abel to Zechariah, that kind of needs a little bit of unpacking. It's kind of a weird phrase there. But Genesis 4 if you remember back in Genesis 4, the, after the fall of man, after Adam and Eve sin, um, they have a couple of kids named Cain and Abel, right? And then Cain kills Abel. So Abel is the first murderer. He's the first, first person that's killed in the Old Testament for his righteousness. And Luke considers uh, all the Old Testament to be prophecy, so he considers Abel to be a prophet in this sense. And then Second Chronicles is, in the Hebrew Old Testament, we have an English Bible, but in the Hebrew Bible, the Second Chronicles is the last book of the Old Testament. So and Zechariah, this person named Zechariah, was the last martyr who's recorded in Second Chronicles. So we have, the, basically the picture here is the first martyr in the first book to the last martyr of the last book. All the way through. So this generation that Jesus is accusing is building monuments to those same prophets, which sound kind of good, but the only problem is they don't pay any attention to what those prophets said. The traditions that these scribes are teaching run counter to what the prophets preached. They're building monuments to people that they don't listen to or agree with or support. And Jesus is calling them out for their hypocrisy. Because as previous generations killed the prophets, this pattern will continue with this generation. Because the same self-righteous people will reject not only the messengers, but the God who sent them. And this generation will kill Jesus, the Messiah, the one the prophets wrote about and spoke of. They're going to threaten and persecute and kill, persecute and kill Jesus. And this is a harsh rebuke because he's basically saying that the theology nerds don't have any idea what they're reading or doing. They've missed the Messiah who's standing there rebuking them. The third woe, verse 52, says, Woe to you, lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. This is the last rebuke. This last rebuke here in verse 52 is that the scribes reject truth and also hinder people from understanding as well. They're the exact opposite of what they think they are, similar to the Pharisees being unmarked graves, right? They've taken away this key of knowledge. This means that they've removed Jesus from the gospel and they're leading others astray with complications and confusions. Now keep in mind, these are Bible experts and Jesus is telling them that they don't understand their Bibles. Jesus is saying woe to those who complicate the gospel. We can't preach rules and morality and then add the gospel as an afterthought. We have to lead with the gospel and then lead other people into freedom, right? Rosaria Butterfield has some excellent thoughts on this in her book called Openness Unhindered. If you don't know her story, she was a a lesbian English professor up in the Northeast, and um, she was immersed in her lifestyle. Believer, long story, but she eventually became a believer and is now the wife of a pastor who homeschools kids and writes Christian books, like a total, like 180, complete 180. But the way she speaks of her conversion struck me as truly beautiful. She says it this way. When the Lord entered my world, I experienced that gospel-ignited, expulsive power of a new affection. That new affection was not heterosexuality, but Jesus, my Jesus, my friend and Savior. I was not converted out of homosexuality. I was converted out of unbelief. And she goes on to talk about how her affection for Jesus led her to want to glorify God with all of her life, including her sexuality. And it talks about her repentance and it talks about her sanctification process. It's a really beautiful thing. I would highly encourage you to read her book. It's really humbling and convicting in a lot of ways. But the point is we don't preach morality and then conversion. That's getting it backwards. That's overcomplicating things. We should proclaim the gospel and lead people to follow Jesus and then help them with discipleship conform their lives to his will out of love and out of worship. 
So just like Rosaria Butterfield's story, it's not going to be a smooth, easy path. It's going to be messy with lots of struggles and complications because life is complicated and life is messy. But the gospel is not complicated. Jesus saves sinners. We start there. And these lawyers miss the kingdom of God and prevent others from seeing it. But Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Let's see how they respond in verses 53 and 54. It's very safe to say that Jesus has successfully ruined this dinner party at this point. Verse 53, as he went away from there, the scribes and Pharisees began to press him hard and provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So this, this kind of tense interchange obviously puts a bit of a damper on the evening part of the, in the, this dinner party, so Jesus leaves. But the response of the scribes and Pharisees is very interesting. They hate him. They hate him enough to set traps for him, to scheme against him, to constantly trip him up, constantly try to trip him up, we should say. They're looking for ways to discredit him, to bring him down, but ultimately they hate him enough to kill him. So Jesus is canceled in the Pharisees' minds. We always talk about Jesus having dinner with all kinds of sinners, with tax collectors and prostitutes, really pretty rough people, right? Rough, rough sort of folks. And they respond to him in all kinds of ways. They respond to him in humility and repentance and gratitude and worship, all kinds of, there's lots of really beautiful depictions of that in scripture. But we don't often talk about Jesus dining with this particular kind of sinner, these Pharisees. And these guys respond with anger, indignation. They're offended. And I, I hope you'll grant me that we're all sinners. I'm certainly a sinner. I hope we can all agree that we're all sinners. So what kind of sinner are you? Are you the sinner who responds to his rebuke with humility and repentance? Or are you the kind of sinner who responds by puffing up with pride and responds to Jesus with a how dare he? Brothers and sisters, there's grace in this warning today, if you will have it. Repentance and humility are what Jesus is driving, th driving toward throughout this passage. And in his rebuke, he wants them to repent of their hypocrisy and pride, but they are unwilling. But I wanna, I wanna take this passage and flip it a little bit and hopefully make this a little bit more palatable. Let's take the flip side of hypocrisy and pride, and rather than six woes, let's see six blessings. And you'll see this is kind of the inverse of what, we're, what we've been talking through. But blessed are you who honor the Lord in faithful obedience and love what he loves. Because with repentance and humility, we will see Jesus purify our hearts, and we will also live in a gracious, loving, righteous way. Blessed are you who humbly and faithfully serve regardless of recognition. Because with repentance and humility, we will be filled with joy to dine at the table with our Savior, no matter what seat he gives us. Blessed are you who are alive in Christ and lead others to him. With repentance and humility, rather than being unmarked graves, we will lead others to an empty tomb and marvel together at what Jesus has done. And blessed are you who find rest in Christ and lead others to him, because with repentance and humility, we will surrender our burdens to Jesus, the one who beckons us to follow him. He welcomes those of us who are weary and heavy laden. And we will follow him with joy because he's gentle and gracious and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And blessed are you who believe that Jesus is the savior because with repentance and humility, we will celebrate the gospel that God has been preaching since before creation began and we will marvel at its beauty for eternity. And then blessed are you who believe and also help others believe because with repentance and humility, we will embrace the good news that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we will also share our faith with others, pointing them to the true righteousness and clearing the pathway into the covenant community of God's people. We spend so much time, so much time, trying to get the outside of the cup all bright and shiny trying to do it all on our own with our rules and our ceremonies, trying to earn God's favor. But there's a better way that leads to peace and life if we just realize that everything we're looking for has already been given to us freely in Christ. The acceptance that you're looking for has already been given to you. 
The significance that you're searching for is already found. The peace and comfort that you can only dream of is at hand. The hope that seems so fleeting is fulfilled in Christ. And going back up to verse 41 where we started, if you give your heart to the Lord, everything will be clean. The beautiful promise is that if we give him our hearts, Jesus cleanses the inside and the outside of our cup. He takes our stubborn, prideful, self-righteous, greedy hearts and he gives us a heart that beats for him. He trades our sinful, selfish actions for his perfect, selfless obedience. He carried our guilt and our shame. He stood in our place. He took our beating. He died our death and he came back to life. And if we believe in him, we share in his new life and we have hope. We don't need more legalism. We don't need more hypocrites. We just need faith in Christ. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we praise you for these words you've spoken. Even though it's a hard message, we praise you for the grace in it. We pray that you would become greater and that we would become less. We ask that you help us live for your glory and for your renown. And let us find our rest in you. It's in your, in your name we pray. Amen.